So it's five oh five. Vanessa, can I start the event? Yes, sure. Okay. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to the IIB six month lecture series on steel bridges presented steel by, by along with JSW. Along with JSW. Today's session is Today's session is R K Goel, R K Goel, sign of open web girl, of open web girl, very stressing, very stressing. We would request everybody, request everybody to be on mute, on mute. To begin this session, I would invite Madam Rohi, Madam Rohi, introduction on I N B, on I N B, Jigs, Jigs. Ruhi. Next, I would request Madam Purnima to please play an introduction video about JSW. India, a nation powered by a billion dreams. Dreams that we aspire to fulfill every day. Together with our collaboration and commitment, as India embraces to be a 5 trillion US dollar economy by 2025, we are all geared up to be a part of this monumental journey to usher in a brighter, better future. Together, we touch ordinary lives and make that difference we better every day together we make steel that you carve into your agri equipment together we sow the seeds of success we make steel that gives the grit and grind to your heavy equipment together we change the landscape of our country we make steel that you beautifully mold into your automobiles just to drive our nation on its path towards prosperity. We make steel that you transform into solar energy. Together, we steer our nation towards a greener tomorrow. We make steel that relays your transmission lines just to brighten the future of millions. We make steel that styles your appliances. Together, we bring 
happy smiles. We make steel that adorns your development projects. Together, we provide shelter to millions. We touch lives, make them better together, every day. We empower communities, make them better together, every day. We nurture dreams, make them better together, every day. As India embarks on its accelerated growth journey, we are firmly placed to leave our mark in it. Together, we touch millions of lives and make them better every day. Thank you, Purnima. Today's event India, is moderated a by engineer Vinay Gupta. Sir, now I would officially hand over the session to you. Thank you. So you are on mute. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I hope I am audible now. So uh, we'll certainly have a very good uh, session today. I'm quite hopeful. But before that, I would like to share a sad news today, which is about the demise of uh, a very, very important uh, person, very learned person, very hardworking person. Shri S. D. Limay, who was also the chairman of Pune Center of IBE. Uh, so before we observe a one minute silence, I will first uh, uh, read out a bit about uh, him so that uh, you're more acquainted with the, who we are talking about. His full name is Engineer Shashikant D. Limay. Uh, he graduated in civil engineering from College of Engineering Pune in 1971 is standing first in the University of Pune and was a recipient of a uh, university gold medal. He did his MTech uh, in structures from IIT Mumbai in 1973. He joined the Indian Railway Services of Engineering IRSE in December 1973 and held various positions in the engineering departments of Western Railway from 1975 to 1983. He worked as professor in Indian Railways Institution, Institute of Civil Engineers, uh, Pune, during 1983 to 1989, as Deputy National Projects Director in UNDP Projects of Development of Bridge Faculty at IRICEN, and he received training in US and UK in modern bridge engineering uh, for one year. Uh, he uh, and this was under the fellowship of UNDP. Now he worked with the Konkan Railway Corporation from 1990 to 1998, almost beginning till the end. The famous Konkan Railway Corporation as chief engineer. From 2001 to 7, he worked as chief operating officer in Indian arm of the of uh, Messrs. Owen William Railways UK, and thereafter from 2007 to 13. Uh, 2013, he uh, he worked as executive director of Stoop Consultants Mumbai. Uh, important project that he dealt with were improvement in uh, geometric design of track in uh, sections between London and uh, Glasgow on British Railways to increase the speed from imagine 160 to 280 kilometers per hour, much more than any speed that we have uh, with modern tilting trains. Uh, design of viaducts and underground uh, stations in DMRC, proof checking of uh, designs of cable state bridge at uh, Moolchand and DMRC in Delhi, uh, which is very close to us in fact, wherever our office is in Delhi. Project management of second Mahanadi railway bridge at Katak, planning, uh, well, um, uh, then this design of cable state bridge, ROB, at Santa Market in Nagpur, and so on. He's a recipient or he was a recipient of several awards. One of them is SB Joshi uh, Award for spreading of engineering knowledge of IEI 1996. Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Mumbai in 2000. SB Joshi Award for excellence in bridge and structural engineering. Uh, distinguished, he was a distinguished alumnus award of uh, National Academy of Indian Railways in 2015. 
Distinguished Alumnus Award of COEP 2019. And recently, he was member technical expert of an advisory committee and technical advisor of Maha Metro, the one who, which has an head, which has headquarters in uh, Nagpur uh, for Pune Metro Railway project and uh, member technical expert committee on Metro project MMRDA. He was member of academic council of College of Engineering Pune, COEP, that has been his love always. And ICI honored him with a lifetime achievement award very recently, I think in 2021. So now you realize who we have uh, lost and who we are missing today is a very vitally important person for this civil engineering fraternity. So in respect uh, of this departed soul and paying homage to the person, uh, we would observe a one minute silence. Uh, please start. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, anyway, the life must go on. So, we will start with our uh, lecture of today, which is by a very important, a very uh, learned person, I must see in, uh, say, in the ra railways, is engineer R.K. Goel. He is a very pleasant, he is a very pleasant, but equally knowledgeable, person. equally knowledgeable person. So I don't know why there is an eco. Why there is an eco? You word about him. Word about him. Engineer Rajendra Kumar. Engineer Rajendra Kumar. IRSC officer. IRSC officer of 1998 batch. 1998 batch. Long experience of design. Long experience of design. Construction. Construction. Railway bridge. Railway bridge. He has earlier worked at earlier worked at bridges as directorate of as directorate of. Where he has developed various has developed various types of steel girder bridges, steel girder bridges, bearings, bearings, dealt with steel is with like steel is towers, like micro towers, I also designed towers, I have Yes, what should I do? I do not know. Now it's very much clear, sir. Oh, so I need to present this uh, slide earlier uh, once again. Yes. Rohi, please do the name for Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, let me repeat in that case, uh, Engineer Ravindra Kumar Goel is an IRSC officer of Indian Railways, 98, 1988 batch. He uh, has a long going experience of design, fabrication, construction and maintenance of railway bridges. He has earlier worked at Bridges and Structures as director of uh, RDSO, where he had developed various guidelines for maintenance of steel girder bridges and bearings, and also dealt with the steel structures like microwave towers. So I was just about telling you that I also designed some 100 microwave antenna towers to be erected about 100 meters, 100 meters long. I'm sorry, 450 towers, 100 meter tall in 1989. Now, he was the key person to revise the fatigue provision in IRS steel bridge code in association with IIT Roorkee. Uh, he holds special diploma in bridge engineering from Messrs. Rambald, Denmark on the design aspects of Bogiebeel Bridge, which is the first steel open web girder bridge in India, having completely welded joints. Comprehensive guidelines for design, fabrication, inspection and maintenance of FOBs on central railways have been issued by him which have been appreciated very well. He is a member of Executive Council of Indian Institution of Bridge Engineers, to which he is associated for the last 20 years. 
In fact, when you talk of FOBs, they may look like simple structures, but they're extremely important. But they really help you cross the traffic or take your vehicle through comfortably. If the pedestrians were to be there and there were no FOBs, you'll have many problems. So anyway, um, uh, with these words, I'll request, uh, now, now let me tell you about this topic. Design of open web girders, we have heard a lot, I think, a lot of us have heard. But including pre stressing is a completely new topic. At least for me, it's a new topic. I have heard, of course, once or twice earlier, but it still has to, it has to go to my head properly. So we'll hear uh, Mr. R.K. Goel. So Mr. Goel, please. Yeah, Rui, you have to uh, stop the uh, this uh, sharing and Goel, sir, will start sharing. Thank you, Engineer Mr. Vinay Gupta ji for a very nice introduction. Uh, I would like to straight away share my screen, kindly allow me to do that. Uh, I hope it is visible now. Yes. Uh, I think it has come up. So uh, uh, the topic has already been introduced by uh, engineer Vinay Gupta, sir. Now this topic uh, is uh, a very intricate uh, topic. Actually, this subject is a very intricate subject. It involves so many things, conceptual design arrangement, and whosoever is designing a open web gutter, he has to uh, understand the difficulties in fabrication, in erection, in maintenance, and uh, about the uh, design of joints, he has to take care of the design life and fatigue consideration most important. So it's a very involved job. So this topic as a whole uh, needs uh, at least six lectures of one hour duration to get a complete feel of it. But I have been told to complete it in 40, 45 minutes, which I will try to do. And I do not know how much justice I, I would be able to do. And then added to it, uh, I have been asked to uh, give, uh, include the pre-stressing part of it also. In fact, camber and pre-stressing is a very uh, different subject. It's a very involved subject. And uh, I remember we have been, uh, uh, I have uh, a lecture on IAB on this subject as a whole uh, for complete one hour duration. So briefly, I will be giving the uh, concepts of pre-stressing and how they are different from the camber at the end of the main lecture that is, the, that is of design of open web girder. So with this uh, brief, I will uh, just like to start. I am not getting. You are not able to change the slide? I am not able to change my slide. Actually, yeah, yeah, so I think it is here, right. Okay. So just to introduce further, uh, open web gutter bridge is also called a truss bridge. So it is used for spans which are greater uh, in uh, length and uh, which cannot be spent very economically by a plate gutter bridge. Usually in uh, railways, we find that limit is about 24.4 uh, meters and uh, all spans about 24.4 meters, uh, we go for open web gutter bridges and we have got a standard arrangement for that, which we will see uh, in greater detail in the coming slides. So in general, truss bridges are used for span greater than 30 meters, I already said, economical as full utilization of sectional area of member is made. This is a very important concept to be understood. Actually, the whole stresses are axial in nature in uh, triangulated girders or open web girders. So you make full utilization of the cross-sectional area. Uh, as compared to, if you say, uh, take the case of plate girder, you have got a triangular type of a distribution of stresses from the compression core to the uh, compression flange to the tension flange. So there you do not get the complete lutination of the uh, cross-sectional area. But of course, there are other advantages. So we go for lower expense, smaller expense, we go for plate girders. And then fabrication, assembly, and launching needs a team of especially trained people. So uh, people go for open web girders, then it is really uh, uh, a necessity and a good economy is uh, going to be achieved. So this is a railway practice. In general, truss bridges are used for spend greater than 30 meters and warrant type of con configuration is used for simplicity. It is a simple triangulation. You can see the uh, uh, sketches below. So 
uh, I have already said plate girders up to 12.2 meter, 18.3 meter, 24.4 meter uh, are standard spans in RDSO and span more than 30 meter are 30.5, 45.7, 61.0, 76.2 .0, meters. Now these are the different types of configurations of trusses. People may use it uh, if they are going for uh, non-standard uh, arrangements. So this is a Hove truss. And this is Parker truss having a uh, R shape. And this is a boasting truss. In fact, this uh, configuration just wanted to show because nowadays many people are using the boasting uh, girder, which are again standard designs issued by RDSO. But if you compare that configuration with this configuration, you will find some diagonal members as if they are missing. So I am not very sure uh, whether uh, the stresses are adequately been taken care of, but since these designs are now standardized and people are using it, so I believe the designer whosoever done it has taken care of the proper uh, design aspect at the connections. Because in uh, road bridges, particularly the fatigue is not that important, but in railway bridges, definitely, the fatigue is a very, very important criteria. So such type of configurations, uh, boasting truss with a triangulated type of arrangement is suitable, but if uh, that, uh, that boasting arrangement without diagonal, that is probably a issue that may need special considerations in design. So this LN type of truss, it involves one extra member in the central panel. So all these arrangements I have taken from the uh, net. This is Baltimore type of truss. It, it is the, adva the advantage of this type of truss is that it reduces the panel length. Now, coming to the design considerations, there are different forms of open web girder bridges. One is through type of a girder, which is very economical and preferred generally. Then we have got deck type, which can be of underslung type, and it can be of normal deck type, having a rectangular kind of a L section. So up to 30.5 meter, it is suitable because there you don't have a floor system. You have got two leaves uh, of uh, trusses and over that straight away at the top cord, the sleepers are resting. But if you go for a uh, higher span, then because of the stability consideration, you have to increase the spacing between the trusses and then you need to design a floor system also. The moment you go for a floor system, the weight of the truss increases and then uh, the economy is basically uh, not there. So in such cases, people prefer to go again for open web girder. And that is precisely the reason why you don't get a standard uh, design of RDSO for more than 30.5 meter per span. Now, some non-standard uh, arrangements can be designed with semi-through type where there are issues of vertical clearances because in open web girders, otherwise we have got a close type of arrangement and the top lateral bracing and uh, the vertical clearances are an issue. So this is a typical arrangement uh, of different members. Uh, you can see in the floor members, these are the stringers and we have got cross beams. Then we have got bracings, cross bracings. So, and then of course in the uh, stringers uh, also, we have got uh, diaphragms and cross bracings. This is underslung type of a arrangement where the bearings are here, you can see, and a whole span is just like a fish belly. It is hanging down from the bearing downwards. Here, uh, there are two leaves over which the, straight away the chan uh, channel sleeper or the bridge timber rest. So components of through girder bridges are floor system. Here we have got cross girders and rail bearers. Then other primary members are bottom cord members which are mostly tension members and top cord members, which are compression in nature, which are having compression and rakers, they can have compression and some bending also because of the wind effects. And then diagonals, we have reversible stress members, depending upon what type of configuration we are using. In present warrant type of truss, we are having a reversal in the diagonal members and verticals, they are mostly tension members and they are also called redundant members because there's very less stress in these members. Now the secondary members are bottom lateral bracings, top lateral bracings, sway bracings and knee bracings, and portal bracings and knee portal. So different 
kinds of forces are uh, carried by these secondary members also then main gussets and bearings this is uh, a uh, figure which shows different members of open web girder here this is the end floor member uh, this is intermediate beams these are the stringers over which the rail passes train passes and there here these are the bottom ports this is the end portal this is complete end portal then you have got top ports and then these are the diagonals now design of bridges on indian railways basically we have got standard spans for uniformity and mass adoption that is the biggest advantage then design of standard span they are all done by rdso approximately 80% spans are standard spans and 30.5 meter span is a very uh, commonly used span and design of non standard spans and substructure are foundation they are done by zonal railways and there is a concept of equivalent uniformly distributed load which is a very old concept and it is uh, being used it gives you a very good idea about the type of forces uh, uh, that are likely to come in a particular member and then the super imposition of loads their effects can also be done by using this approach so bridge rule contains eudls for various uh, types of loadings they give their eudls are for bending moment eudls are for shear force and besides that there are longitudinal forces given for different spans in tabular form so eudl is the load which induces equal bending moment or shear force corresponding to the worst combination of moving axle loads of rolling stock so type of truss i have mentioned varan truss with vertical for standard railway spans and other forms can also be adopted as per the uh site conditions or the situations required number of panels there are norms for that weight of the truss versus floor system the issue is if you have uh, less number of panels your cross beams would be lesser but your uh, design of uh, stringers and bottom cords will uh, will be uh, increased will be heavier so you have to strike a balance and usually the optimum number is 6 to 10 then length of panel it again there is a uh tug of war between the weight of the truss and the floor system the optimum length is 6 meter to 9 meter then inclination of the diagonals so the guidelines are you have to keep the inclination of the diagonals from 45 degree to 60 degree these all these things are based on practice and they have been specified in steel bridge code of uh, issued by rdso the height of truss now uh, height of truss uh, through type versus deck type uh it is between 1 by 8th and 1 by 5th 1/5th uh, to 1/8th of the span length and then spacing of trusses it has to be sufficient to prevent overturning due to lateral loads usually it is more than 1/3 of the height of the truss and uh, uh, and 1/20th of the span that means if you are going for 200 uh, feet span then uh 1/20th is 10 feet about 3 meter will be the spacing of the trusses now estimation of loads these are the different types of loadings and for all these loadings this is starting for bgml loading is the oldest loading 1926 then rbg loading 1975 uh, mbg loading 1986 25 ton loading 2008 then we are now having new loadings hm loading and dfc loading dfc loading is basically 32.5 ton xl load so for all these loadings the eudl tables are available in bridge rules and the loads are dead load uh dead load is uh, basically dead load of the truss then we have got superimposed dead loads that includes the weight of the track sleeper and uh, any pathway etc all those things then we have got the dynamic effects for which the formula have been given in bridge rules then longitudinal forces raking forces which are because of the sinusoidal motion of the train and wind pressure effects and forces and effects due to earthquake so we consider either of the two either the wind or the earthquake whichever is more that is considered depending upon the uh, seismic zone now the dead load is very clear it is assumed before the design based on the experience of earlier designs then after design of trust the actual load of uh, actual dead load is verified and if there is difference between the two then the assumed dead load is revised and the structure is redesigned with the revised dead load now live load for that there are clauses clause 2.3 of bridge rule it gives you uh, the formula for dynamic augment 
and based on that we work out and there are tables given in bridge rules to straight away get this uh, depending upon the loaded length so ideal for bending moment and ideal for sport shear force so these things are these are also given the tables are given in bridge rule from where we straight away pick up the ideal dynamic effects i have told cda the formula for cda is 0.15 plus 8 divided by 6 plus l where l is the uh, loaded length of the span and it is the maximum value can be 1 now longitudinal forces is uh, they are given in clause 2.8 of the bridge rule and value of longitudinal force due to either tractive effort or braking force the longitudinal force can come either through the tractive effort or due to braking so sudden braking the maximum braking force whatever can, uh, can uh, whatever can uh, occur in a particular loading that is given in bridge rule i will be showing you the tables how they are uh, there in the bridge rules So values depend on loaded length, maximum of the tractive effort. Dono में से जो दोनों में whatever is more in between the two tractive effort or backward that is adopted. Now raking forces they are given in 2.9 clause 2.9 of bridge rule, uh, 600 kg per meter, and raking force not to be considered for calculating stresses in cords or flanges or main girders. Now the wind pressure effects they are to be taken uh, as per clause 2.11 of the bridge rules. wind pressure expressed as a equivalent static pressure in windward direction and on the leeward direction 50% is taken so uh, uh, the bridge shall not be considered to carry any live load when wind pressure at deck level exceeds 150 kg per meter square actually that kind of a situation will be very for a very brief period of time so at that time the possibility of having a live load also on the bridge is very very low so this exemption has been given so wind force simply wind pressure into exposed area so exposed area is area of moving load and the exposed area of the truss member so we will be seeing the detailed calculations for that now the for seismic forces again horizontal seismic force and vertical seismic force uh, they are calculated based on the consideration of seismic zone importance of structure and its soil foundation system and uh, these are the formulae given in uh, uh, old bridge rule but now i understand there is a new uh, seismic code come up uh, for uh, i uh, from rdso so those provisions are to be used which are definitely an improvement over these forces so this is the way to work out the uh, seismic force i think this the detailed analysis is uh, uh, to be done as per the uh, seismic code so when we are acting in the direction perpendicular to traffic then 50% of design live load without impact is to be considered and when we are considering the live load in the direction of the traffic it is to be uh, ignored so analysis of forces so analysis can be done using the suitable computer programs or by hand calculations uh, hand calculation is done using the inference line diagram concept which is very easy to use so uh, ild is basically nothing but the response uh, of a unit load moving from one end to another end over a particular member so uh, these uh, things are again shown in the tables which are likely to come in the coming slides so dead load analysis is simple we work out the dead load uh, based on the assumed dead load and then per truss it will be half of that so they are again calculated forces in individual members are calculated based on ild concept now what are the ilds if we see a truss of this kind so the different members will have different types of influence line diagrams now this is the influence diagram for l0 l1 if i go back what is l0 l1 l0 l1 is the bottom cord so when a unit load moves the uh, force in this member will start increasing and when the unit load will in lead, uh, reach at this uh, location that is this location then it is the maximum and then again it will start decreasing and it will keep on decreasing when the unit load goes away from the truss similarly this is for l2 l3 and l3 l4 this is loaded length complete span 
and this is for L4, L5, and this is for U1, U2, and U2, U3. Of course, they will be having compression. Then this is for U3, U4, and U4, U5. Compression again. Then L0, U1, that is the end portal. It will be again having compression. This is the ILD for that. So these are for the diagonal members. In diagonal members, the stress reversal takes place. Then the unit load starts from one side. Initially, there would be tension. And then after a uh, certain uh, distance, then the reversal of stress will start. And this is basically, uh, in fatigue analysis, these two loads are added. There is a uh, methodology given in steel bridge code. This is again for L2, L3, another diagonal. Reversal of stresses is there. And this is for the vertical members, L1, U1, L3, U3, L5, U5. Now, live load analysis is uh, very simple to be done uh, by based on these ILD diagrams. We work out the total area of the ILD and uh, the live load, uh, so, sorry, live load is basically uh, uh, that coefficient of dining augment. So we have the uh, live load intensity for code members, which is half of the UDL, total UDL that is given in uh, tables in bridge rules for that particular kind of a loading. So end raker has compression LD, loaded length is length of the span. So live load intensity for end raker is UDL shear divided by twice the loaded length. Actually, we have to see which member will get which kind of a force. So, and for the for the bottom core members and the top core members, we take the UDL for bending moment, and for end breaker, we take the UDL for shear. So, CDA for uh, end breaker is calculated using taking length as span length. Then, diagonal members have are having both tension and compression. Loaded length for tension and compression is found from ILD diagram again. Live load intensity and CDA for diagonals are calculated on tension and compression, both based on their respective load lengths. So force due to live load is ILD area into live load intensity. Force due to dynamic augment is equal to CDA into force due to live load. So this is very simple. So CDA we have worked out 0 0.15 plus 6 upon 8 plus L. So longitudinal force taken only for, only for the bottom core members. Because when the breaking occurs, sudden breaking will occur, it will be only uh, through the bottom codes. It will go towards the end uh, port, uh, end beam, end cross beam. And from there, it will go directly to the uh, bearings. And through that, from bearings, it will go to the abutments, pier or abutments. For bottom code member in, in end panel, loaded length for longitudinal force is full length, full span. And loaded length reduces by one panel length as we take bottom cores of other panels starting from end to center. So this is to be uh, taken care of. This is the IRS bridge rule, which uh, gives the loaded length, which is equal to effective expense for bending moment. I will show you the table. These are just say, this is for 25 ton loading, which is very common loading. Most of the bridges are being designed for this loading nowadays. Uh, you see the table, total load for bending moment for spans. If the span is say 5 meter, 4 meter, 5 meter, the total load for bending moment is given. Then total load for shear force is given and impact factor is also given. So one need not to do calculations. Straight away from this table, you will get the three things. Total load for bending moment, total load for shear force, total load uh, total uh, live load due to impact. Uh, this is for longitudinal forces again. The tables are given. Uh, tractive effort, breaking force, and maximum longitudinal force, which is maximum of the two. Tractive effort or breaking force ka jo maximum hoga, that is, that is uh, over here. So it varies as per the length. Now, wind load analysis. This is a general concept of load transfer and how the wind forces are distributed among the members. So wind load is basically wind pressure into exposed area. Exposed area is area of moving load plus exposed area of truss member. So if this, if this is the truss and this is shaded portion is the moving train, then we 
have five regions. One is the uh, bottom code area. Other is the bottom code to moving load in between the bot, uh, in between the moving load and the bottom code. That is the area second. Then the moving load area three. Then over the moving load and below the top code area four. Then the top code that is the area five. So these five regions are there where the wind is to be seen. How the wind forces are acting. So this is a typical way of uh, working out the wind load. Uh, at between rail level and bottom of bottom code, this whole force is worked out based on the area multiplied by the uh, wind intensity, and this is carried by the bottom code. Similarly, the area between moving load and rail level of stranger, that is the area B2, it is again carried to bottom code. Then moving load B3, there is a separate way of analyzing the effect of this uh, force. Then top code and top of moving load T1, top code T2, and then gussets at the top T2. Again, all these are added. This is again shown in different way. So I think it's very clear. A, B, C, D, and E and F. Now summary of projected area, bottom code and top code. We work out what, how much uh, is the exposed area. And this is a way we work out the wind force. Top code wind pressure 18 to 1.5. This 1.5 has been taken because uh, on the leeward girder, 50% of the wind load is assumed. It is, this is as per the caudal provision. Caudal provision. So wind force on the bottom code, this is 1.5 into A, B minus B3 plus B3. So a nodal force at the top code and intermediate node, then it is distributed on different nodes. Similarly, in bottom code, it is distributed on different nodes. And then we do the analysis in a horizontal plane also for the uh, wind analysis. And this ultimately, all this load is taken care of by the bracing, top code bracings and the bottom code bracing. They are designed for the uh, uh, analyzed stresses. Now, seismic force analysis. Seismic force is collected in horizontal and vertical direction. In horizontal direction, seismic force calculated for bottom code and top code. And on bottom code, seismic force is due to dead load as well as live load. Uh, on top code, seismic force is uh, due to dead load only. It is obvious because the bottom code is uh, carrying the whole weight of the uh, moving train also. So in vertical direction, seismic force is due to dead load as well as live load. And analysis of seismic force for forces is members is same as that of wind force. Now force in trust member found by adding forces due to dead load, then live load, and then the dynamic effects or the uh, basically live load. Uh, live load is basically due to dynamic effects and uh, uh, live load and dynamic effect, yes. Uh, is the, uh, dynamic effect means CDA, effect of CDA. Then longitudinal loads, wind loads, or seismic loads, that higher of the two. Now design of stranger, it is just it is done just like a plate girder. So I will not go into detail of this. This is simpler. Similarly, design uh, again, this is design of stranger only. Uh, design of connection between web and flange, it is done for shear uh, calculation of horizontal shear at the level of weld. That is very important. And permissible stress in weld is taken from the appendix G of SBC and close 13.4 of welded bridge code. And size of weld is calculated subject to close 6.2 of welded bridge code. Basically, the point is there are guidelines given for design of each and every component of the open web girder in steel bridge code or relevant uh, other codes like welded bridge code or bridge rules. Now, design of stringer, provision of stiffness is made. There is 11 clauses there. Design of stringer bracings, calculation of later load, how it is to be done, clause uh, is given in the rule. And analysis for force in stringer bracings. Again, uh, there are provisions. Design of stringer bracings is uh, done as per 6.2.3 and 3.8 of steel bridge code. Now, design of cross girder is again as per the plate girder design. Simple methodology. Only thing is L4CDA is taken 2.5 times of the cross-gutter spacing. 
this is specified in the uh, table where the uh, CDA values are given in bridge rules. Now, again, connection of cross data with stranger. This is very important. Number of rivets are to be worked out for one span loaded or both span loaded, both, both the conditions. And connection of cross data with vertical and bottom code. Connection of cross data with vertical and bottom code. Uh, this is very important. Uh, actually, the, uh, there are typical arrangements of a uh, triangular member being attend, uh, uh, which is uh, designed to uh, ensure that there is no uh, uh, subsequent deformation taking place at that location. Now, design of bottom code, they are designed as tension members. And uh, section assumed for bottom code members, that is taking into consideration clause 4.5 and clause 6.7 of steel bridge code. Effective sectional area of section is calculated by deducting the uh, area for the holes that we made that we make for the uh, for the rivets or the bolts. Nowadays, we are having HSFG bolts. So the net area is to be taken into consideration. Actual stress is calculated for axial tension for without longitudinal and seismic or wind forces and with longitudinal and seismic or wind forces, two types of conditions. This I think we will be uh, more clear when we see the table. Design of bottom code may again permissive stress for wind or uh, if we are designing it for the uh, occasional loads that is wind or seismic then the permissive stress are increased and uh, uh, section is to be safe in both the cases with or without occasional loads then design of stitching weld calculation of force at the level of weld uh, permissive stress in weld is to be taken by the appendix G of steel bridge code and clause 13.4 of welded bridge code. And then size of weld is calculated based on clause 6.2 of welded bridge code. So design of lacing and wetting of tension members is uh, uh, given, provisions are given in clause 6.9 and 6.10 of steel bridge code. And design of diaphragm is as per clause 6.16 of steel bridge code. Now design of code, top code, it is done for the compression. Uh, it is, uh, the design is done as per the compression uh, member assuming the top code as compression member and section uh, is uh, designed as per clause 4.5 and clause 6.2 of steel bridge code effective area of the section is taken as per clause 6.2.2 of steel bridge code again actual stress is calculated for excel compression without seismic or wind forces and with seismic or wind forces and permissible stresses in excel compression uh, is minimum of basic permissible stresses, then stress in axial compression and permissible stress in fatigue. So the minimum of the three. Again, these are same clause, permissive stresses are increased by 16.67%. And uh, this is again, design of stitching weld, design of lacing bracing, this we have covered. Design of end raker, it is uh, again, uh, Subjected to, to this is subjected to axial compression and some bending also. This bending comes because of the wind effect or the seismic effect also. So section is assumed for end breaker, taking into consideration clause 4.5 and clause 6.2 of steel bridge code. Effective area of section is to be taken as per clause 6.2.2. So again, without seismic or wind force, or with or uh, with seismic and wind force. Permissive stress is again as per code. So all these things are again uh, in mere repetition. Diagonal verticals, designs are reversible members. Diagonals are reversible um, stress members. So they are to be subsequently, after we do the complete design, every member is to be assessed for a specified design life that is of 100 years and a specified uh, loading intensity that is the annual GMT, that is 50 GMT. So that is for the fatigue to ensure that the 400 years, there is no damage in the uh, in any of the member or any of the connection because of the fatigue. I think I can skip this because uh, this is design of top lateral bracings. All these bracings are to be basically designed for the uh, uh, wind uh, forces 
that are to be taken care of uh, and the, all these forces are calculated by analyzing the horizontal truss at the top level and the bottom level also. Design of bottom lateral bracing similarly, uh, because of the wind forces, uh, the bottom frame uh, in a horizontal plane, it is to be analyzed. Now, coming to the design of joints, connection at intersection is done as per clause 6.12 of steel bridge code. Rivet value is calculated for rivets. Nowadays, HSFG bolts are used, so we work, we can calculate the value of the HSFG bolt, how much uh, one HSFG bolt can contribute to strength. Then number of HSFG bolts uh, are to be calculated based on uh, force in the member, simply by dividing the uh, force by the rivet value or the HSFG bolt value. So the arrangement of rivets at a joint is to be done as per clause 7.1 to 7.9 of steel bridge code. The splicing of members is done as per clause 6.11, 6.11 of steel bridge code. Now, this is the summary table that we get uh, by doing the analysis. You see there are different members uh, in the first column. Then uh, this is the ordinate of the uh, influence line diagram, I see if I am not wrong, total length, ILD area, yes. This is the influence line diagram. Ordinate means maximum height of the influence line di diagram in tension or in compression. For bottom course, you will have only the tension. This is the ordinate. And this is the loaded length. That is the full span length. This is a 78 meter span. And we work out the total area of the ILD, that is it. So that way we get the ILD area for each and every member. And this ILD area comes over here. Then we have got dead load intensity, that is 10 per meter, total load of the truss divided by the total length in centimeters. In 10 per centimeter, we get this load intensity. And similarly, we have got live load intensity. And then we have got the CDA. So this is the live load, this is the dynamic augment. So uh, these values are obtained. Then next table, we get the uh, values of the forces that are uh, coming in different members. Like L0, L1, the total tension, this much is the tension we are getting. Top codes, this much is the compression we are getting. Due to, that is due to dead load, then we, we get due to live load, tension. Then impact load, again tension. Forces in member without occasional loads. So, uh, if we don't consider the earthquake and wind, then the total force in that particular member is tabulated here. Right? Similarly, top code, and then you see the diagonals, you will get tension and compression both. These are the diagonals, you get tension as well as compression. So, the complete table we get. Now, similarly, for seismic and uh, wind force ke liye bhi table banti hai. Forces remember without occasional load that we have got, then we work out the uh, forces due to wind and longitudinal force. They are tabulated here because of the seismic force, they are tabulated. And if you see in this particular case, the seismic forces are more, either this is 344, this is 384, so seismic forces are more. So we ignore this wind uh, forces and we take into consideration the seismic forces along with the uh, other forces. So this combination will prevail over here. Now, after doing all this exercise, we get the stresses, uh, forces in the individual members. Now, after doing this, we will do a fatigue assessment uh, for the design life of 100 years. For this, the clause 3.6 of a steel bridge code uh, uh, under the tightest fluctuation of stresses gives the provisions and that complete fatigue uh, analysis is done uh, uh, for which I think IIB is having one a separate lecture on it, uh, on its uh, website. One can uh, go through that to get a first-hand idea about the uh, fatigue life assessment. Now, the concept of camber, which is very often uh, misunderstood by the people, uh, many people consider that uh, we get the pre-stressing in uh, individual 
trust members because of uh, camber only whereas there are two concepts one is camber and other is pre stressing the two are entirely different concepts so this difference i would like to explain by these uh, three four slides that i am showing you so camber is a functional requirement to avoid effects of vertical deformation under moving trains if you make any beam and you load it you will definitely get some deflection some deformation and uh, if you if you want under service conditions there is that there should not be any deformation so you have to provide the upward uh, camber in advance so that when the actual deflection comes so practically a observer an an observer does not see any sag in the beam so that concept is used uh, in camber basically to neutralize the deformation now you can see this shape of the truss this is the shape of a normal truss and if we load it then usually we will get some deflection which will be a uh, maximum deflection under the given design loads and if we want the deflected shape to remain horizontal then we have to provide upward camber so that when the load actually comes this uh, deformed shape is practically in a horizontal plane so this is for neutralizing the deformation now pre stressing concept is a different concept it is done in addition to the camber to develop reverse kind of stresses in various members at the stage of no load so no saving of material is intended over here however we get some economy besides getting reduced stresses during the service so girders can be designed as cambered with or without pre stressing and there is a there is a clear cut provision given in steel bridge board which says that uh, you can design the girder as only cambered girder and it is preferable to design it as cambered plus pre stressed so there are some differences in the design provisions for doing that so the advantage is the secondary stresses are ignored if we are designing the girder as pre stressed girder along with the cambering cambering is essential so lot of quality control in fabrication is uh, required when we design the girder as pre stressed girder now to explain the uh, issue further the shortening and elongation of member how it is helpful in giving some kind of a pre stressing in the members if you see the second picture over here we have got a fixed length a and b between the two supports two fixed supports and we have got a uh, member a steel member of course which is of length l and i want to have this member uh, to have some pre tension or pre compression in one case i want to have pre tension in second case i want to have some pre compression introduced so what i do to introduce the tension what i will do i will fabricate the member uh, in such a way that the actual length is less than this length ab so a1 b1 length if it is less than ab then there is a shortening shortening of the member length so my uh, deformation is delta l and delta l fl upon ae formula if i apply uh, apply apply then i get uh, that amount of shortening that is required to uh, introduce the tension amounting f1 f1 force similarly for introducing compression i will have to increase the length of the member originally and then when i will do force fitting in between a and b the member 2 will definitely get some compression so concept is simple camber is to neutralize the deformation and pre stressing is to neutralize the stresses now we can say a simple bracket uh, arrangement uh, if i take in black if you see there is a bracket a c b if i make a bracket a c b and no load is applied then this member a c will be horizontal and b c will be uh, as it is and uh, under a load w this c will come to c dash there there will be some deformation and this will be the deformed shape in green color you can see and if i want that the de after deformation 
this member a c dash should remain horizontal then what i will do i will uh, make this member a c something smaller in length so that this point c dash is somewhere here and this uh, member b c again something uh, some longer uh, so that uh, it comes here so if we if we draw a perpendicular from here so i will get this much of elongation so when i make this structure in such a way then after application of load w this c dash c double dash will come at c and there would be no deformation seen practically now if i want to introduce pre stressing also now a c b i have fabricated in such a way that it is having camber and after deformation this c will come here but at the same time now i want this member which is usually supposed to have tension that it should not have any tension after loading with w then i will do some kind of a uh, elastic shortening and elastic elongation so this to introduce compression initially i will have to make this member a bit longer and this member a bit shorter and by force fitting i will put both these members at c so then finally this member when loaded with w it will be theoretically having no stresses and it will be having no deformation also practically no will no one will see the, that there is any deformation and theoretically there would not be any stresses in both the members so this is in nutshell the concept of pre stressing which is being uh, practiced in all the designs of rdso standard uh, trusses and many people are not aware of it so uh this is uh, important to know because many times we are dealing with the existing uh, play, uh existing uh, open web gutter bridges also so we must know that this is a uh, advantageous uh, situation for the uh, bridges which have been designed with pre stressing all these things are i think uh, i can leave now this i have explained already and this is the amount of deflection that we assume while giving the pre camber thank you very much i hope i could not breach the time limit given to me thank you sir thank you thank you mr goel very interesting and i am hearing this presentation uh, that is the last part i must say probably second or third time but still i am <laughs> trying to scratch my head and understand Uh, really interesting and very useful i must say uh, first of all before we go into our panel discussion and questions and answers oh, uh, i must uh, ask uh, ruhi are you ready with the uh, this uh, can you project the slide for the next event which is on 27th in uh, may in delhi yes sir can you please project that for the people's information okay while you're projecting pr that in the meantime i'll inform uh, all the audience that uh, the next lecture of this series which will be the fifth such uh, the series that is sponsored by gsw and uh, of course that's a great help that they have provided to ibe uh, will be on 17 june uh, dr harshavardhan subarao he will be the speaker uh, and he will be speaking on a 4.4 km long diga sonpur rail kam road bridge in bihar which means more like a double decker similar to one you see here in the picture although that is a different context and 4 uh, and 1/2 km long which they were involved in there the last one that is on 15 july so the first one i said is 17 june please come one come all all of you must join and also get others to join Uh, on 15 July, we'll have a, a presentation by uh, engineer V N Hegde, and he'll be presenting on something another different topic. Unlike you saw this, uh, sorry, uh, other way you saw pre-stressing, you'll see a topic there which is decarbonization of steel, decarbonization of steel for durability. And then followed by, uh, I mean, following that, we will also have a panel discussion which will be like the. end of the series of six lectures ending with a panel discussion 
with a lot of enrichment of everyone's knowledge, including that of panelists and yours. And now coming to what uh, uh, our head office has projected to you, uh, can you put it on full screen, uh, Ruhi? Ruhi, can yeah, yeah, okay, okay, it's a PDF, fine. So friends, uh, we have also started uh, organizing uh, in-person physical events. And uh, next event that we have will be on 27th May in uh, Delhi, a uh, place called CSY in Chanakyapuri, uh, which will be basically on double decker bridges. And there are two presenters of two different projects of double decker. Uh, one is uh, uh, engineer, uh, sorry, Dr. Professor Anurag Mishra, Professor Dr. Anurag Mishra. He's from IIT Jammu. And other is uh, Mr. Sai Baba Ankala. Uh, he's uh, a part of uh, Indian Railways, very similar to uh, Mr. Uh, um, uh, R.K. Goel. And both of them will be presenting their respective double-decker bridges. Now, double-decker Pika segmental, when we are talking about, this means that the lower deck, which is a wide one, carries the highway traffic, the road traffic. The upper one, which is a narrower one, it carries the metro. And the construction and design both, they become a challenge. For one reason that the pier from the lower deck passes through the lower deck and go to the upper deck. So there's a different uh, design concept. And other challenge is how to erect both these segments, the upper level, lower level, that without hitting, hitting the crane, while you're erecting one, the other one should not get hit. Those things will be discussed threadbare. And I know that the project of uh, uh, Professor Anurag Mishra is Jaipur Metro Double Decker. In India, so far, we have three double deckers. Uh, one is Jaipur, other is Nagpur, third one is coming up in Pune, and fourth one, is coming up in Delhi that we are designing, uh, Delhi Metro. So we'll have very interesting presentation. Of course, we will follow it uh, by uh, cocktails and dinner. So please come and join at Delhi. Thank you so much. And uh, Rohi, thank you for projecting it. I'll go to the next part of it about this, uh, uh, I would say the presentation. Uh, I must say that uh, engineer Ravindra Goel, has presented a real life method of analyzing and designing open web girders. Because the way he explained each and every aspect of uh, designing, of course, we'll have uh, questions from you and please feel free to ask as many questions as you like. He even went to the grassroot level of ILD, influence line diagram, in uh, bottom core, top core, bracings, everything. So that's where we are. And the other thing he told about how to take the, there's a confusion he clarified among the people's mind, the span L for coefficient of dynamic augmentation. And that span L is between the cross girders and not the whole span. There's no confusion, is very clear. And lastly, of course, he explained very well about the pre-stressing and its purpose. Like we talk of it in concrete, where we pre-stress it to counteract the tensions that we have so here again, we counteract the pre-stressing, uh, the rather tensions through pre-stressing in steel, apart from cambering, apart from shortening the length, and apart from you know, uh, sort of varying the length, that finally after uh, loading, it should come to the required profile. But then we also providing some kind of a uh, pre-compression kind of a force in the steel. In fact, I would have been very happy if there were some pictures to show how it is done actually. So on the whole, very interesting, very pleasant, and very pioneering kind of a concept. And he said, the railways are always using it. I just did not know, maybe many of you would. So I think with these words, uh, uh, in a way I'm done. Uh, now let me see who are the other panelists before we go to the questions. And in the meantime, I request all the audience to please put your questions in the question answer box, Q&A box, please. So, Mr. Uh, uh, first of all, our sponsor, Mr. Vinay Pandey, would you like to say something? Because uh, I wanted to actually convey a message to everybody, which I forgot. The message is that we must not be biased towards concrete or steel. As engineers, we must decide, we must make a right choice that in which conditions steel is better, in which conditions concrete is better. 
all of both of them have some merits and some demerits and some limitations for example if you're worried about a weight somewhere whatever be the reason but if there is a weight then no matter about uh, durability cost this and that because there are ways and means to uh, counter that you have to go for steel and you must go for steel then there is a thing that you want something to be looking as nice as concrete in some funny shapes or maybe 3d printed concrete then of course you have to go for uh, concrete but usually in both these nowadays we go for segmental approach in concrete we tend to go for a precast segmental and pre stress it in a steel also we uh, manufacture a long beam truss whatever in several segments which can be transported brought to the site assembled using hsfg boards which mr uh, rk goel said and these hsfg boards have become increasingly popular for the site fabrication and the fabrication at the at the factory <clears throat> a workshop would be done normally using submerged arc welding of a bridge quality welding i must say so uh, i think uh, we have both the choices but uh, and i said we should not be biased on anyone we should not say concrete is superior or steel is superior we must weigh uh, the merits and demerits of each in the given conditions and then tailor the product be in steel or be it in concrete uh, i request uh, mr pandey to please say a few words thank you mr gupta uh, first of all thank you very much mr goel is a wonderful presentation and uh, i on behalf of jsw i thank all participants this is a knowledge sharing platform and uh, the entire series of lectures are part of knowledge dissemination program uh, basically to uh, enrich people who has uh, there are a lot of engineers who has designed wonderful bridges who can share their case studies to the other uh, audiences participants who can learn from there and moving forward they can design wonderful bridges for the country so i thank everyone for participating in this and uh, uh, thanks mr goel for sharing such knowledge now coming to one thing is the steel uh, definitely a steel each of the product as mr gupta explained has its own advantages and uh, all the materials should be used to its maximum strength steel has got the the burn, wonderful quality of circular economy it provides circular economy so it is recyclable 100% and uh, yeah, without compromising on any strength you can uh, recycle it so today if you are making a structure in a steel 100 years down the line you are creating an asset for the future generation because the circular economy will also decarbonize the entire construction process so that's the advantage with the steel brings in added to the other technical advantages which mr gupta has already uh, explained so thank you once again uh, to mr gupta to mr goel and uh, all participants i hope they they must have enriched their knowledge uh, with the wonderful design concept presented by mr goel especially camber and pre stressing thank you thank you very much oh uh, thank you mr pandey Uh, may i now request uh, engineer tarun goel uh, who i have been closely associated with very knowledgeable person and when we think of steel we think of tarun goel or when we think of tarun goel we think of steel thank, thank so, you for your kind words thank you for your kind words uh, so it was a fantastic presentation and this uh, goel touched upon various aspects of open web builders in great detail and i am sure and uh, every participant must have found it interesting and learned from it i mean uh, de design of steel bridges particularly open web builder is a vast topic how it was covered efficiently in the presentation uh, the topic uh, this topic does not uh, i mean uh, not only requires deep structural knowledge but also field knowledge because how we are executing a bridge what kind of connections are being used steel i mean uh, is it uh, hsfg bolts or is it uh, welded type so that uh, thing needs to be catered into the design so that that's how i mean it is a little different from pre stressing or pre stress bridge or concrete bridge uh, would also request mr goel uh, to touch upon uh, assessment of fatigue design life of existing old bridges maybe in another 
another presentation because that in indian railway there are many old bridges which have passed their lives so we need to assess uh, from fatigue criteria whether uh, how much life is remaining for those bridges so we will request uh, mr goel to take upon that uh, topic uh, in another presentation and i once again thank mr goel for that delightful presentation thank you mm thank you thank you mr tarun so uh, if everybody permits i'll take up the questions we have about 15 to 20 questions in the question box the first question is by ashish why is it that eu dl up to 10 meter for maximum bending moment and uh, and after 10 meter it is moment at 1 by 6 of the length so can you answer uh, actually uh, i have shown you a sample uh, type of a page actually the complete table goes into two three pages i have uh, uh, for the purpose of uh, making the slide i have used only the first page so if you see the bridge rule you will get more pages you will get the more uh, uh, spans also right so the next one is by uh, thota murlidhar wind load is to be considered both on the train as well as the truss also is it okay that is right actually wind is to be uh, considered for uh, five different regions which i have explained one is the bottom cord and the second is between the bottom cord and the moving load third is the moving load fourth is the moving load and below the top cord then the fifth one is the top cord so for all these uh, components there is a definite set of procedure which is to be adopted for wind load analysis right Ms. Harinder Dogra is asking very interesting question. Does the speed of train affect design considerations? Yes, yes. Actually, the uh, this is part of the bridge rule. When we uh, talk about the speed, it is basically a load. It is part of the load. If you increase the speed, your uh, dead load uh, remains the same, live load remains the same, but the impact in, uh, is uh, increased. So uh, the cda formula that we have in our bridge rule that caters for a speed of 165 kmph for passenger trains and 125 kmph for goods trains so up to that speed if you are running the trains then there is uh, no need to worry they are taken care of by the cda but if you have to design a bridge for a speed in excess of 165 kmph then you have to account for or you have to provide you have to suggest some modification in the cda so a question may come that if the speed is only supposing less say about uh, 80 km per hour for whatever reason can the cda yeah. be reduced as well the question is ki whether you are designing for the indian railways or you are designing for some yeah. private railway if for some private railway then you can definitely reduce but if you are designing for indian railways and that too for a uh, standard span then you have to adopt for the uh, codal provision Mm. so his next line on the same question was uh, increasingly higher speed are being achieved so what is the impact of this uh up to 165 kmph i have told there is no issue if you are going higher than that and if it is a passenger train then you have to work out what is the effect on cda so now this we are dealing with lot of high speed trains like 300 km per hour 225 km per hour yes we have to increase the cda so right. in that case we need to do uh, dynamic analysis like for ncrt uh, that yes. may be required may not be required actually the problem is there is a very uh, limited research in this field in the country right whatever research is there that is there in uh, other country european countries right right So next one is uh, Venkateshwara Rao Surati. Uh, what kind of protection is envisaged for a steel truss bridge against corrosion? Let's say design life of hundred years. Actually, this is a very important topic, and it can be covered in a one-hour duration. Uh, if you ask me, uh, there are different uh, kinds of systems. Uh, one is uh, a normal conventional system wherein we do the painting. Uh, we do the first primer coat, then uh, a intermediate coat, then the final coat. There is a complete scheme of painting given in uh, again uh, B1 document that many of us know. 
and uh, that is to be followed but if somebody is interested to have a higher type of a production there are long life painting schemes available so up to 15 20 years they don't require any uh, second uh, attention which means paint will not have a life of 100 years you have to go on uh, redoing it see, after 15 years or 20 uh, years see, or whatever uh, acha okay it's a very interesting question actually very close to my heart uh, the real production to steel is the primer coat which many of people many of people uh, they forget to apply they straight away apply the finishing coat so we have to understand the complete philosophy how does it work it's a complete system you have got the primer coat which protects the steel then you have got a uh, uh, intermediate coat many times or you straight away have two coats of finishing paint so the finishing paint the finishing coat that protects the primer so with this three tier of protection there is no other protection required if you keep on after every 5 years if you keep on uh, doing the finishing coat once more then your primer will remain always intact and right. the second problem is that when the people inspect the bridge they see the main member they don't see the connections and these connections are the uh, critical areas and these are the locations which are very difficult to inspect these are the location which are very difficult to paint right so one has to focus on connections if you want to increase the design life of the bridge uh, rather the uh, not the design life the service life of the bridge yes thank you uh, another one from harinder dogra is uh, sorry is 800 is a steel coat are you using this coat or not is 800 is basically for buildings buildings uh is sbc same as is 800 no, no steel bridge code is an entirely different code it is dedicated to steel bridges of indian railways and it is to be used in uh, uh in association with bridge rules and irs steel uh, welded bridge code and other uh, guidelines for fabrication and inspection well that's indian problem we have irc for uh, highway bridges we have bis for buildings we have uh, IRS for railway bridges and God knows how many, but yes. we can't help it. We have to follow in within their domain. Yes. Uh, Deepak Shinde has a question: How the ILD ordinate is greater than one in summary table? Uh, I don't think it is ILD ordinate. It must be the total area of okay. the uh, ILD diagram. Okay. Okay. Our very young civil engineer, Doctor S K Dhawan. i think nobody can say he doesn't know him i think he is around 75 80 years old recently done his phd he has some question question is please explain the adequacy of section in the design of open web girder bridge yes so there are three types of members one is the tension member other is the compression member and the other there is a bending member so in bending members are basically uh, the cross cross beams and the stringers they are bending members and uh, you have got the bottom cords tension members top cords uh, compression members so the tension member is to be designed based on the net area concept at the connection when you detect the area for holes then whatever net area you get and uh, the permissible stress so you work out how much is the uh, net area requirement that is very simple okay so the next one is by mohammad yunus ahmed how to apply pre stressing in open web actually uh, i would request you please go through uh, the iib website there is a complete lecture on it you will find it very interesting and uh, you will get all the answers there but can you give a gist of it so that uh, at I least i have explained in the know. last slides uh, yeah. see what is pre stressing you have to introduce a reverse kind of stress in a particular member suppose you are having a tension member and you want to have no stress during uh, uh, finally under the load so you would like to pre compress it so for doing the pre compressing for introducing pre compression you have to uh, increase the length of this member in between the two supports and then do force fitting when you do will when you will be doing force fitting you will be compressing this member to the uh, actual length that is required in between support a and b and when you fit it and leave it then this member will be having the compression so when the actual tensile load will come so this will get negated right 
Uh, Naveen Kumar Chaudhary is asking, can you share this presentation to attendees? I think some recording must be done. Uh, I think, uh, are you doing some kind of a recording of this lecture that can be shared, I think, in IAB website? Recording is being done, but basically uh, recording is not as such supplied in terms of, uh, 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 what do you call it, pen drive or something or website. But uh, since live streaming is being done, it will be available on YouTube. Am I right, Rohi? Rohi, can you unmute and tell me? It will be available on YouTube, I guess. Oh, sorry. She is probably not there. Okay, we'll answer this question in a while. So uh, the video is right now live streamed on YouTube. So they can just go to our channel at IIB and they can see the video. And will it be available later also? Yes, sir. Okay. So I think that answers the question. Uh, Heman says, thank you, sir. The talk, uh, the talk provided strong foundation for open web girder bridges covering uh, influence, influence line diagram, loading element of bridge, IRS clause, and deflection. So he is uh, praising thank the uh, thank you for your presentation, as I also said. Okay. So Kalyan Sarkar says, sir, thank you very much for the presentation. Such a lucid and simplified manner. Do uh, we do we do fatigue check for diagonal members only or for all members? I th yeah, this is done for all the members and all the connections. This is a very involved job, and there is a separate lecture on IAB website for this. Right. Uh, Pratesh G. Thange, his question is uh, why is it said that pre-stressing is not considered as a method to economize the design in steel? The codal provision of IRS steel bridge code says that you will design the open web girder uh, as a pre stress girder, but you will not take the advantage of pre stressing. So basically, you are, uh, you are uh, giving this uh, as an extra safeguard. Uh, yes. You understand? Uh, am, I, uh, am I clear about it? Yeah. So, it does not go in costing, but it goes in quality it will basically improve your uh, life. Right. The bridge will not get uh, stressed to the actual stresses. And in fact, when you do the instrumentation, this is very important to note, when you do the instrumentation, you will, you will find very less stresses coming at uh, the locations where you can intend the stresses should be more. So that is because of the pre-stressing. So when you know this thing, that all open web girders designed by RDSO are being designed as pre-stress girders, so you will know why the stresses are coming low. Uh, Safi Halim has a question. Cambering is done for live loads also. That's a question he's asking. Uh, see, uh, cambering is done for uh, live load. Uh, if you are doing, if you are designing it as a pre-stressed girder, then the cambering is done for the dead load plus full live load and full impact load. Live load plus uh, live load plus impact load plus dead load, full complete. But if you are designing it as only cambered without pre-stressing, then the live load is taken as seventy-five percent. This is again given in relevant clause in IRS steel bridge code. Okay. Uh, another uh, encouraging question uh, from S S I R. I don't know what its full name is. The organizer is required to arrange a webinar on flexi arch bridge. So let us see if we get some good speakers, we can arrange a set of lectures on flexi arch bridges. Uh, another question from the same person. What are the root causes or root cause findings of few major incidents happened in the station platform FOB and recommendations to avoid similar incidents in future? And one of the main causes is lack of awareness about the design practices and the lack of interest uh, in learning the subject of bridge engineering. And added to it, there is no separate branch of bridge engineering in India. In India. Uh, rather, we have tried to see it as well. As also, there is very uh, few places where we have a separate branch of bridge engineering. So we have to encourage this. We have to say it often that we need a separate specialization for bridge engineering so that our people are more aware 
they can take more confident decisions. There are uh, 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 less conclusions and they are more confident. So, Heyman's next question is, is it only primary member connection are using HSFG? Can secondary member connection of the primary and uh, primary with grade 8.8 .8 or 5.6 bolts without DTI washers? Uh, this is a very practical question and uh, I have, uh, I had a real, a real problem about this uh, when I was in charge of the workshop at Manmad. Actually, the design provides for HSFG connections even for the secondary member. But the guidelines which have been issued for HSFG bolts that says that the uh, surfaces are to be, first of all, they are to be sand blasted. Then only HSFG bolt is to be provided. Now, practically, it is not possible to carry a member to the sand blasting uh, uh, section. And then just for the sake of uh, uh, providing HSFG bolt for the secondary members. So I have allowed them to uh, go for riveting for all those locations. And uh, that otherwise, that will affect the production in a very, very adverse manner. So in my opinion, the primary members only should be uh, designed for HSFG. And secondary members, they can be uh, riveted or they can be bolted simply. So one other question by uh, SIR, I don't know what it means, is uh, lessons learned at this stage of design, construction, and maintenance? Would you like to throw some light on it? There are many. There are many which I have learned for the last 20 years. I am still learning. <laughs> but uh, they cannot be deliberated uh, in a few minutes. You need to have a session for that. Mm. So Arun, uh, Arun Kumar Gana Sekaran is asking the same question. Is how is pre-stressing by force fitting carried out at site? Is any special equipment required for bridge with large cross-section members? I think uh, for this uh, purpose only, uh, we had a separate lecture on IIB where uh, the complete details, including design, fabrication, inspection, and then uh, uh, that method of uh, force fitting was discussed at length. So this should be available at IIB uh, site, I think. I would request uh, Mr. Anukumar to kindly go through the IIB site and find the relevant lecture there. It is very interesting to, uh, uh, to looking at so many questions on this topic. Let us have one more lecture sometime, which will be only on pre-stressing of steel open web girders. I think uh, previous lectures have covered almost everything. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's decide. Let us see. Let us think. Uh, then Sahil, uh, yes, Sahil Patali can, uh, is asking, can you explain regarding LWR forces considered and code, of, code for the same? This is a very important topic for which we don't have any Indian uh, code. Uh, whatever we have uh, is a UIC code and everybody is following that. But I think there is a great scope of doing research on this topic. It hmm. will reduce the cost of structures substantially if somebody does uh, somebody does a very uh, systematic research on this topic. It's a very important topic. So questions are over, uh, and thank you very much for this. Now, before we uh, kind of uh, come to a closing uh, session, I'll request uh, Ms. Purnima Singh if she has to say a few words, or she would like to say a few words. And Purnimaji, you will have to unmute yourself before you speak. Uh, Ms. Purnima Singh, would you like to say something? All right. So uh, I think she has chosen not to. Uh, I may I request, uh, okay, well, sir, do, would you like to say anything uh, uh, about the whole thing and Whatever I mean, you like to uh, add anything. I think uh, I have spoken enough. Okay. Uh, if there is any specific uh, issue, then I can uh, definitely give my remarks. Okay. So, Deepika, if you are there, can I request you to propose a word of thanks? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. To all the honorable dignitaries, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a word of thanks 
for our special lecture. I, on behalf of IIB, extend a very hearty word of thanks to all the members and non-members for gracing us with your presence and sharing with us your valuable feedback and suggestions. Firstly, I would like to thank our Director General, Engineer DJ Dipte, for always providing us with a vision for the future of IIB. Our President Engineer Vinay Gupta for constantly guiding, motivating, and inspiring us to achieve the vision. I would like to thank our Treasurer, late Mr. P. R. Kelkar, for being a strong support of IIB. He will always be a part of IIB. Our Honorary Secretary, Engineer Sopnil Joshi, for always managing this platform. Our Honorary Secretary, Dr. Gopal Rai, who is always guiding us throughout in this process. I would like to thanks to our today's speaker, Engineer R.K. Goel, for providing a very informative session on design of open web girders, including pre-stressing. I would like to thanks our moderator, Engineer Vinay Gupta, for successfully moderating the session. I would also like to thanks to all our eminent executive committee members for their valuable presence and support. I would like to thank Ruhi Agarwal, coordinator of IIB, for always helping and managing all the events of IIB. Last but not the least, Mr. Josefa for all his IT support. Also to all the huge participants for always coming in huge numbers to make this webinar a success. Thank you, everyone. So please do join us on 17 June. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Engineer Vinay Gupta ji. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. Right. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.